This is the day the Lord has made. Let us all rejoice and let us be glad in it. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Sorry. Happy Sabbath morning, all. Happy Sabbath morning to all newcomers, all those in the congregation, all those online. Happy Sabbath, Kim. I know that you. This is your first time in the church, um, but you've been studying with Pastor Royston and Kim, so. Happy Sabbath to her. Um, I hope that we've all had a good week. I hope that this month of February has been good. I hope it's been fruitful. I hope there's been more ups and downs than downs, but there are blessings found in the downs, so we are thankful for the downs. Um, So let us be thankful and let us pray. Heavenly Father, We are thankful for the week that you have brought us through. We're thankful for your everlasting love and your grace that you have shown towards us, Lord. We're thankful for the very breath in our lungs that you have given us, Lord. Lord, on this, your holy Sabbath day, help us to delight in you, Lord. Help us to delight in your word, Lord. And be with us as we are studying, Lord. Open up our hearts, our minds, Um, Open us up, Lord, and pour out your Holy Spirit on us so we can truly see um, and hear the message that you have for us today, Lord. Help us to truly receive it and um, keep it in our hearts, Lord. In your precious and holy name we pray, amen. Thank you so much, Sister Diane. It's wonderful that we can be together again studying the word of the Lord. I don't know what kind of week you've had. If you've had a tough week, we're grateful that God has brought you through the tough week. If you've had a good week, all praises go to God that he's kept you safe, that you can be here together with us on this, his Sabbath day. And if you've had a celebratory week, whether you've had a birthday anniversary or something else that you're celebrating, we want to praise God again for the goodness that he has given you. This is Croydon Sabbath School panel coming out to you live today is the 12th of February, unless you're watching it catch on Catch Up, and it's two minutes past 10 um, GMT. So We are going to study God's Word. If you don't have a quarterly or adult study guide, as it's called, you'll see something come up on your screen that can tell you where you can download a copy that you can follow the study today. And if it is your first time tuning in, make sure it's not your last time, and be sure to invite somebody to tune in on Sabbath mornings as we study God's Word. It's an interactive study time. We want to hear from you. We want to hear from our church congregation as well. And, and Kim, again, welcome to you as it's your first time. Let's hope we don't disappoint you because you've been watching us online. This is the real thing. So we're glad that you're here with us on this Sabbath morning. As usual, I have a panel with me. But first, let me go to our senior pastor, Pastor Royston. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Elder Johnny. What a lesson. What a lesson. And I'm I'm looking forward to the conversations that um, we'll be having in church and those our viewers online. And I'm sure at the end we'll be so inspired that amidst our challenges, amidst our difficulties, we will be able, by the strength of God, as the as the lesson talked about, and I'm not going to go into it, that he's the anchor of our soul. We're going to go into that and explore that. Amen. I can't wait, Elder Johnny. Amen. Thank you. And we also welcome back Elder Claudia Panatescu. Good morning, Elder Claudia. Can you hear me okay? Uh, Yes, Ah, I can. I was just on mute, so. Uh, Yes, good morning. Uh, I'm really pleased and I'm really privileged to be here. Wonderful. And welcome back to Elder Peter. Good morning, Elder. Good morning and Sabbath blessings to all. We have a deep lesson today, as Pastor has said, and there'll be a lot that we could unfold. Let's allow the Holy Spirit to enable us to do that. Amen. So let's welcome our radio listeners. I left you till last because you are special to us as well. So welcome to those listening on Adventist Radio and those listening on Life Radio. We want to hear from everyone. So if you're on YouTube or live stream, just post your questions or your comments in the chat 
For those of you that are on Adventist Radio London, get in touch in the normal way. Text um, your comment to 8228, uh, leave a space, put the word hope, and then put in your comments. You can also send an email to studio at adventistradio.london. And on Life Radio, your email address is studio at liferadio.uk. And your WhatsApp number is the usual one, 07311-409-409. So we want to hear from everyone today in the church, online, and even on the radio. But at this time, I'll ask Pastor to lead us into prayer. What a friend we have in Jesus. Amen. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Lord, today, as we reflect on that which we have studied, lift our spirits. Give us the energy, give us the, the strength that we need because we do have trials and we do have difficult situations. And sometimes we want to give up. But Lord, may our anchor hold in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Pastor. So we're already at lesson number seven in our series, In These Last Days, the message of Hebrews. And today we're looking at lesson seven, as I've said, it's Jesus, the anchor of the soul. Our member verse comes from Hebrews 6, verses 19 through to 20, and we have Brother Vincent Ohamara, hopefully I said that correct, sir, who is going to read our memory verse for us at this time. Thank you very much, sir. For those of you that didn't hear that, we're going to be picking up the memory verse a bit later on, but thank you very much. And we're going to press on with our study for this week. Now, Pastor, even the most upbeat persons among us, like your good self, can face discourage discouragement through life's trials. Tell us, what would your counsel to the congregation, to the viewers, to the listeners tuning in this morning or, or wherever they are listening, um, what would be your encouragement on coping with discouragement so that we don't fall away? I think on, on Wednesday evening, Elder Johnny, and viewers and members, um, we, we had this discussion, you know, um, about to pray or not to pray or when to pray. You know the story of Jesus, um, you know, constantly praying when he went into the garden and he prayed once disciples were sleeping prayed twice came back they were sleeping and he came back and then he says sleep on and take your rest um, so I asked a question to those who were present and I think Elder Helen Wright made a very powerful point she says and, and, I, and this is why I'm making this point she says um, that your circumstances will change your challenges will change but Jesus never changed. Mm. Mm. Now, now that, that, that bolstered my, my thinking. I was like, wow. When I read the question that you sent out, Ella Joan, I said, wow, mm. this actually is the answer. The constancy of Jesus, the fact that he's always there, um, is so encouraging to myself. I mean, I can remember my own situation where I was totally adrift, you know, like a boat. I just want to use this metaphor, drifting. And and I know some people f might find this ridiculous, but I call upon the name of the Lord, and suddenly, life changed. I mean, even though the situation didn't totally go away, but what I've discovered, Elder Johnny, and viewers and members in the church, that every time I call upon the name of the Lord in my good times, in my difficult times, somehow there's a shift. I, I, I can't explain it, Sometimes I don't even understand it, uh, but, but I recognize that, as the songwriter says, um, we have an anchor that keeps the soul. Um, so do you agree with Pastor 
what's your advice? What advice would you give to somebody who comes up to you or, or, or somebody who is going through a discouraging time? What advice would you give to people about handling discouragement? Let's have your comments, your thoughts coming in online or from the church too in terms of how you deal with discouragement. While you're thinking about that, Hebrews 6 opens with the Apostle Paul reminding all about the principles and doctrines uh, that we need when striving for perfection through faith in Christ Jesus. Elder Claudia, coming to you first of all, uh, what does Paul go on to say in Hebrews 6, verses 4 through to 5, please, and expand on the metaphor that he's used there? Yes, uh, so I'm going to read from um, New King James Version. For it, if it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Paul is addressing to his um, Hebrew brethren and the, the chapter starts with him saying, we, we are, we, I don't see a, a growth in you. I don't see you growing. I don't see you. You are still in the, in the infant stage. And I would like to tell you something, but I just, you are not there yet. And he's saying uh, in, chap, in uh, verse 4 that you need to grow because it, if you don't grow, the only option would be to uh, slide back. You, you, if you don't go forward, you will go backwards. That's the only option you have. So he's saying, you, you have tasted the good word. So you had experiences. We all had experiences. This is how we came to, to God. Uh, I'm sure everybody would agree with me that we, when we come to God, we, we are not... Um, coming here for any privileges. We are coming here because we are convinced, you are convicted, and we are uh, willing to engage in the fight against sin and to hold on to Jesus. Mm -hmm. So this is what he's saying. You had this experience, you discovered uh, uh, Jesus, you understood, and now you are going back to your child state. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the word Just before I come to our congregation, Elder Peter, taste is, is clearly the metaphor that's being used. Um, are there any other biblical texts that come to mind that encourage you to taste of God's goodness? The first text that springs to mind, of course, is um, Psalm 34, verse 8, which says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Now, how can I tell what something is like how sweet a mango, oh, perhaps you have one. <laughs> right, you see this beautiful mango here? <laughs> how can I tell how sweet this mango is if I just look at it? One cannot know what a particular food tastes like until they have actually tasted it. In the same way, one cannot know how good God is if they haven't tasted his goodness. And again, the psalmist in Psalm 119, verse 103, uses a metaphor to link tasting God's goodness with God's word. He says there, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Wow. It's, it's, it's a first-hand experience that counts. The psalmist didn't say, how sweet are your words to my friend's mm -hmm. taste. So to know how sweet God's words are, you must experience them for yourself, just like I can't bite into this mango and say, boy, this is sweet. And you can't, you can't experience that sweetness because you're not tasting it. The New Testament, in fact, also gives an example of what happens when we taste God's goodness in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, where he says, lay aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, evil speaking, as newborn babes, as Elder Claudia just mentioned, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby if indeed you have tasted 
that the Lord is gracious. So whilst we can be encouraged by other people's testimonies, your spiritual growth depends on your spiritual experience, not somebody else's. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, one of our regular contributors from the congregation will speak at this time. Good morning, Mum. Good morning, and good morning to all. I stand to speak or to reply to the first question on encourage, discouragement. Discouragement is one of the evil one's mighty weapon he uses on God's people. I know through, I've learned through experience during this time we are living that uh, the more you want to please the Lord, the more you want to do what he says, you find that discouragement comes in between. You will just finish praying, and even you, you're trying to get something to put into your stomach for the first thing in the, in the day. And you find discouragement harping upon you, surrounding you. Well, what I do, by God's help, I speak God's words. Whatever he told me, I speak those words. And I have learned that praying back God's word to him, especially his precious promises that he gives to you, it is not only of vital importance, but also it does good for your very being. And so, I've learned to do that. And right now I'm having it, but God is good. Because I say, God, you have said so and so, and I believe it. And by your grace and your mercy, Lord, I am still holding on to that which you will make real. And so I remember always, which I repeat at times, Proverbs 3, 6, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. And why I stick to that too is because our sinful mind is making havoc with us, and more we allow it to, is more it will do. But let Christ be if even you cannot see what you want, but God tell you he will do it. Hold fast to it. Believe in it. And by his faith, your eye will see through the faith of Christ what the reality will be. And I believe it because he has said it. Amen. Amen. So some good counsel there that's coming in, some good practical advice and some texts about tasting of the Lord's goodness and trusting in him. Pastor, any comments coming in online? Yes, Elder Johnny. Um, someone quoted Psalm 91, 2 and Psalm 46, 1 to 3 that says Jesus is our, God, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Someone also quoted, um, Brother Mombi quoted Psalm, Proverbs 18, verse 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are saved. So true. Um, Rodney says um, it's about faith. Faith sustains him today. And then he says it's about hope. Hope propels him for tomorrow. Good point. Garnet says he goes to the promises in the Bible, Elise, Elise Clark says, God is bigger than her problem. She has discovered that. Um, Simone McFarlane says that she would encourage people to build a relationship with God, telling him everything that you're going through, and thank God for everything as well. And there is a bit of conversation going on about um, growing in Christ at the moment. Um, uh, somebody was given an illustration of having a, a child being breastfed up until eight years old as a metaphor that their Christians have been in the church for 50 years and they're still feeding on breast milk, spiritual breast milk. Um, and, and that as Christians, we, we need to understand the concept that we will, we will go through trials. It's just a natural part of the Christian 
pathway. Karen B. then says, yesterday is history, today is the present, tomorrow is the mystery. So forget about what has happened. Live for today and, and, and have hope for tomorrow. Always try Jesus. I like that. Esther seems to be quoting one of my favorite songs, 462, um, Blessed Assurance. She says, there's assurance that comes with believing God. He does all things in his time, and it is something worth remembering when feeling discouraged. Um, Anthony Brumble says, discouragement can be transformed into opportunities to help us develop resolve and self-discipline to keep moving on in faith. I think the concept that is coming through Elijah, and I think, I think as, as Christians we need to realize that um, we are not exempt from challenges, even though we believe in God. Clive Johnson says, real life experience, no science theory, focus. I like what he says, he says focus, a command, fix eyes on the Lord. This will filter out the noise around us. And that is so true. And let me just read the final um, two comments. One from Elder Stanley says, um, quoting um, John chapter 14, 1 to 3, let not your heart be troubled. I can hear the church reading with me. He believe in God, believe also in? In my Father's house are many. If it were not so, I would have. So the concept is faith for today Hope for tomorrow, believing in God. And Gwyneth Johnson said, it's great to quote scripture, but sometimes we need to be more practical. I would help the person to look back at when God had been with them and use their past experiences to build their trust. Obviously, but we know that the strength comes in, 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 in when you're being sustained by the word of God. Over to you, Elder Johnny. Thank you. Keep those comments coming in and comments from the church as well. We have a thinking class this morning, Pastor. So let me go out with another question. When the wilderness generation first tasted manna, it was literally heavenly. But after a while, it no longer had the taste they wanted. Is the word of God just about flavor on the tongue? Let's have your comments on that. Is the word of God just about the flavor on the tongue? Good to hear your feedback on that one as well. In the meantime, let's, let's continue in Hebrews 6. So, Elder Peter, Hebrews 6 verse 4 opened with, for it is impossible. So it's setting the context for the words that follow. What does verse 6 go on to say is also impossible? And what do you understand from this verse, please? Right, verse 6 says, And if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Now, there's a lot in, in that text alone, but I need to refer, if I'm allowed, to, to back to verses 4 and 5, sure. where um, Elder Claudia read earlier, because this text, verse 6, implies that the person being spoken of has already known God, because it says there, they were once enlight enlightened. That means they understood God's word. They've tasted the heavenly gift. That means they've had an, a personal experience of God's goodness. They've become partakers of the Holy Spirit. They've experienced that Holy Spirit and even maybe shared the Holy Spirit with others. They've tasted the good word of God. They've experienced the benefits of following God's will and the powers of the age to come. Like in Joel 2, it says your sons and your daughters will prophesy, old men will dream dreams and so on. Um, now, verse 6 moves from the past tense of verses 4 and 5 about what the believers were like before to the present tense mentioning that they are now falling away by allowing themselves to be controlled by their sinful nature and becoming enslaved in sin. Um, similarly to how in Revelation 2, we hear about the people in the church that have lost their first love. Now, some people do fall away, but they recognize those faults further down the line. And for those people, they, they are actually forgiven, like um, David in the Bible, Peter in the Bible. But these ones being spoken about in verse 6, however, they're the ones that further distance themselves from God and effectively crucify Christ again by negating that sacrifice that he made on their behalf. That is which the thing that put 
Christ to an open shame before. So this ongoing rejection of Christ by the people that were once enlightened actually mocks Christ. When we think of crucifying Jesus, Jesus, when he was crucified, he was immobilized. He couldn't move. It made him inactive and unable to do anything. So for these people, Jesus is unable to do anything because they're not allowing him to. They're mocking him. And it's creating such a gap that makes the experience of knowing Christ unworkable to the extent that a relationship with him is no longer possible. Deep, deep thoughts and, and, and good comparison coming through there. Um, so, Elder Claudia, how do Matthew 16, 24 and Galatians 2, 20 shed further light on what Elder Peter has just shared there, please? Yes. Um, I will um, read again from the New King James Version. Um, so Matthew 16, 24 is Jesus who said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And in Galatians 2, 20, Paul is, is um, basically showing the application of this. And he says, I have been crucified with Christ. Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So, is, is this um, desire of us to accept Jesus in our life, and we we need to accept Jesus in our life um, as a king. We we like to think that, and it is true that Jesus is our friend and Jesus is our brother. But we need to learn to accept him as our king, and then we will find. It, I think will make it easier for us to understand that we need to obey. And by him being our brother and our, our friend, he would help us to go through all the trials and tribulations we might go through. But first of all, we have to obey. And obeying is to, as uh, Paul says, crucify myself. Crucify my desires, crucify everything. And like Elder Peter said earlier, just put them on the cross, make them inactive. And like a corpse is, which is can't, can't move and can't react to anything, this is what our desires should be in regard to the will of God. Interesting, interesting. Elder Peter, let me just jump back to you. Anything you wanted to add based on what Elder Claudia just said? Yeah, based on those two texts and Elder Claudia's good exposition of them, I just think of something I heard recently. It says that when we look at ourselves, we could see every reason why we can't make it. But when we look at Christ, we can see every reason why we can make it. Okay. Good points coming in there. And I'm encouraging those in our congregation to share a point as well. I think we've got somebody coming to the mic. So, Pastor, I'll be coming to you shortly. But just a point. Well, actually, let me take the point from the floor just in case uh, this point is going to come out. Good morning to Elder David. You are in the church this morning. Good to see you. Good morning. Uh, just in regard to the, the concept of crucifying Christ again and, um, and getting to a point where um, our salvation or the, the initial engagement with God that led to our salvation becomes null and void, um, I think it's, it's held up in, in Hebrews 6, um, verse 1, although we're looking at Hebrews 6, so, so, um, 4 and 5. So just looking at, at verse 4, it says it's impossible for those who have once been enlightened to have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. So again, once you've actually been through that process, the question is, were you ever really converted? Um, I, I think that's the issue. But the, the, the way to remain daily um, uh, on, on, on the right path um, is to have a daily 
experience of conversion. And, and that's why Paul in verse 1 says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, which we know, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance, which we know, dead works, and faith toward God, which we know, of doctrine of baptism, which we know, and laying on the hands of resurrection of dead. In other words, all of these fundamental things we know. So why do we, why are we, those of us who are seasoned in the faith, constantly regurgitate and move on um, uh, without moving on because the gospel is progressive. It is progressive and there are big, uh, greater things to know and understand and yet we tend to stay within this pool of knowledge which we keep regurgitating and regurgitating and then we become dead. We have to grow, we have to develop we have to move on. And this is what Paul is saying, that if we, let, let's leave that aside. Not that these things aren't important. They're important. For new believers, we communicate. But let us move on to understanding deeper and greater things uh, than we've ever understood before. There are things that are available to us to understand that our predecessors uh, um, never knew. They could never understand the environment that we're in today and the way to apply the gospel. So the, the, quest, the issue is, let's move on, let's develop, let's encourage um, un uh, understanding beyond what we already know, uh, and we will see that we'll grow and we'll always be, um, you know, for many of us, we, we, we read the Bible, you know, like early, morning, early hours of this morning, I was reading the, the Bible and just finding more things which I'd never understood, never appreciated, and some things I can't even express because it's spiritually discerned. So that's the way to get, keep excited and keep growing and developing and keep um, in favor with God and making sure that our salvation is a daily and continual experience that we can continue to share. Excellent. Great comments. Keep them coming in, both from the floor and those online. Pastor, what is our online church saying? <laughs> yep. Well, I think David, um, let me use a bit of theology here as I normally do. He's talking about um, justification. You know, just making things right, and then he's talking about sanctification, which is a which is a lifelong experience, and obviously there's going to be glorification, which is basically looking forward to the second coming of Christ, and that is important, and that is why um, J. G. says they were content until they looked back to Egypt. They had a variety of food, but somehow forgot they were slaves. Cued focus. Then, then she says, the taste of God's word is not about today or yesterday, but looking at glorification eternity. Um, I think it's, uh, Rose Philip says, like David said, you, you taste, but were you convinced? If you know the word, but it is not transformed, what use is that? You know? And, and that's a very, very powerful thought. Rodney says, if, if, if our ship, if our anchor should slip, we, immediate, we, are, we, are, we are in immediate danger of shipwreck. Now, he, he made mention of a text, and I quickly zapped to the text, and 1 Timothy 1, verse 19, holding on to faith and, good, and a good conscience, which some of us have rejected, and so have suffered shipwreck with, with, with regards to our faith. So it's holding on to that anchor, and I'm sure we're going to be going deeper into the concept of who that anchor is. Miguel over there in Belgium just sent me a text. Miguel says, the text, oh, taste and see that, that the Lord is good. I think it implies a two-part process. He says, taste and visual. This is what he says. He says, I'm going to read it. I think each action is coupled with the other. We cannot experience the full goodness of good without tasting and seeing his goodness, which allows us to have the total spectrum of his love towards us. This allows us to have a total conversion of our faith towards him. This is how we will grow in the grace of God. And that's from Miguel and Angela over there in Belgium. Very powerful. We have to taste it, but we also have to see it. And obviously when you taste this feeling that comes, all the senses comes in mind. Can I read one more point, uh, Ella Johnny, from, from Geraldine, if I can find what Geraldine says here. Geraldine says, but, you do, but, 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 but do you think that the Word of God is also palatable to when it, when it corrects you? The Word of God is always a sword that, that cuts deeply. I feel that it is God's, God allowing His Holy Spirit 
to be working. And as he said, it is, it is a constant work in progress. You know, it's a daily grind. You know, yesterday's food is not sufficient for today's hunger. We, we have to go back and immerse ourselves into the Word. And just to say hello to Eve over there in Michigan, who said she's worshipping with us. Over to you, Elder Johnny. Wonderful. Great thoughts, great analogies. Keep them coming in. If you're just tuning in on the radio, this is Croydon Sabbath School panel coming out to you live. We want to hear from you as well. Um, okay, let me go out with another question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, Jesus invites believers to take up their cross and follow him. What is the difference between taking the cross and submitting to abuse from others? This was in your quarterly, so you may have written an answer down, so come and share it with us. Jesus invites believers to take up their cross and to follow him. What is the difference between taking the cross and submitting to abuse from others? It'd be good to hear your comments and feedback on that. So despite the warning in Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 6 that we've just read, a similar counsel from Paul is repeated in Hebrews chapter 10. Elder Claude, if you could just read for us, please, Hebrews 10, verses 26 through to 29, and expand on the different circumstances of unforgiveness that are mentioned here. Hebrews 10, 26 through to 29, please. Thank you. Um, yes, I will read from the uh, international version. Um, it just, it's clearer and I found it. And it says, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the spirit of grace. Obviously, this is referring to the continuous sinning. And um, I, I like the commentary which is in the quarterly and which says, once again, a present ongoing deliberate persistence of in sin is described here. So this is not talking about uh, one-off when we sleep and then we repent, like Elder Pete mentioned, uh, uh, David and Peter, and uh, they both had at that time a, ch a, a, a choice to carry on in their sin or to repent and uh, leave the sin. But they chose to repent and leave sin alone and follow Jesus. And this is what he says in here that uh, some people have trampled underfoot the Son of God and have profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and outraged the Spirit of grace. Their actions portray Jesus as an enemy with his blood devoid of his saving power. These individuals arrogantly insult and spurn God's offer of grace. Such people do not even want to repent. And this is the difference. So if, you are, if one person goes to that point when they don't even want to repent, this is the, the stage which is addressed in this, in this um, uh, uh, text because they are demonstrating an attitude of open defiance against Christ and his work. Thus, repentance is impossible. Mm. Um, I mean, the, the, the lesson title for that day was No Sacrifice for Sins Left. Now, Elder Peter, when the example of a remnant 
the leftover is mentioned in the Bible, it's usually something positive. But clearly, remnant sin, if there is such an expression, is not something to hold on to, is it? Mm. Interesting to remnant sin. So as you said, a remnant is something that is left over. And when we think of sin, we need repentance. And repentance is about actually letting go rather than keeping hold of that remnant, which is a piece. All right, if we've got remnant material, for, for instance, if we hold on to that remnant material after you make a suit or, or a piece of clothing or something, that remnant might be useful because you might be able to make something else out of it. But if it's not likely to serve a purpose, it needs to be let go. In the same way you hear of a remnant carpet, some people even go to a shop and buy remnants of carpet. If you hold on to the remnants of the carpet, it could be held on to be used in a smaller room or something like that. It could be useful, could be used somewhere else. But if it's not likely to serve a purpose, it needs to be let go. Now, remnant sin should never be held on to. It never serves a beneficial purpose and it actually can fester and grow. Um, Elder Claudia used the New International Version, was it, when she read that scripture? I looked at that as well, but I also looked at the New Living Translation and that last part of the New Living Translation, verse 29 of Hebrews 10, says they have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings mercy on us. Those are serious words. That it's that remnant sin that leads to the insulting of the Spirit of grace. Some people refer to it as the unpardonable sin. Now, we've heard that all sins will be forgiven apart from when you continually reject that Holy Spirit and it's a continuous rejection of the Holy Spirit by re regularly returning to sin or holding on to that remnant with no regard of God at all that is what will deaden one's desire for anything pertaining to Christ and even though Christ would still accept the sinner back if repentant that callous sinner doesn't see any need for repenting or even acknowledging the existence of Christ. And that's why it's um, the title of the lesson. I forgot the title again, but it's, it's that's what is a no, sac no sacrifice for sin because the person has disallowed themselves um, that opportunity for, of repentance. Explained. Yes, as I said, I don't know if remnant sin is a term, but thank you for explaining that in such a good way. Elder Claudia, did you have anything to come back on? Maybe just to um, stress that uh, it is not Jesus who cannot forgive. Mm. It is the sinner who cannot go back to repent and ask for forgiveness. Mm. So the, the, it's an unpardonable sin because the conscience of, of the sinner is seared and they just cannot ask for mercy anymore. Yes. I'm glad you expanded on that because obviously the sinner can go back, but it's because they're in a place that they don't want to. So, so, so absolutely. Pastor, there was the question I asked about, um, is there a, a difference between taking up the cross and submitting to abuse? Anything coming in on that or other comments, please? Those of us in, the, in, the, in, you know, in church will be coming and giving their points in a minute. Um, Elise Clark says the question can be a bit ambiguous because it depends on the abuse. Um, on who it's coming from. If the abuse from others is because we're serving God, then that's what Christ meant by saying, taking up the cross uh, and follow. Rodney talks about, and this is one of my favorite texts, you know, Romans 7, that talks about um, each time I try to do good, evil presents itself. Rodney talks about um, us having enthroned the old man of sin. Right, sitting, sitting on the throne, sitting in our hearts. If, if the old man of sin sits there, then our hearts will never be changed, even if we come to church every Sabbath. Uh, you know, and I find that to be very, a very powerful thought. Um, Kupata um, and Antiga, I, I hope I said it right, says, the continuous sinning will lead to the hardening of the heart. By doing this, um, we become disconnected from Christ. And that's a very, very powerful thought. 
um, Sister Samuels over there in Montreal says, take up your cross and follow me, means to, means to me being, I will, I'm willing to die if it takes abuse from others in order to follow Christ. Jesus giving up everything, dying to self, absolute surrender. It's critically important. Now, Carla now asks the question, is taking up my cross burden bearing or being willing to die to self? I think it's both. Because once you take up the cross, you know, it's, it's gonna, it, it, it will bear you down. But also, by taking up the cross, you're also dying to self. And without dying to self, you cannot, you cannot serve Christ. Mm. Because it is very important that both, you have, once you, when you take up the cross, Elder John, the cross is a heavy, it's That's a right. heavy thing. That's right. Mm. You know, Christ actually needed somebody to help him to actually carry his cross. Mm. And that is why we need Christ to help us to carry our cross. Tom Tom says, there's no difference between taking up the cross and suffering abuse. If the abuse is the result of my faith and belief in God. V, v, VK says, Christ dealt with abuse by putting the abuser before God and was, and was exalted when he rose again. This is one of the ways how we can take up our cross. And I like that. Because sometimes we want to lash out or we want to respond to those who are abusing us. But here, here VK is saying, listen to me, one of the best ways to take up the cross and, and, and being abused is, right, taking those individuals before the throne of grace. And didn't Jesus do that? Mm. He did that all the time. Um, Nigel Archer says, there's always a possibility with God. Our, presumption, our presumptuous sinning creates the impossibility. And I was, and I, you know, as I looked in the lesson this week, I, I kind of asked myself the question, um, am I preaching the gospel but I'm not living the gospel. Mm. I can't ask myself the question this morning, Elder John, and our viewers, and also in church. I also ask, my quest- I also ask myself the question, um, am I just existing, mm. or am I really a cross-bearer for Christ? Mm. Because these are questions. Sometimes you get caught up in trying to, to teach the lesson that you don't live the lesson. Mm. You're trying to find out what the lesson says, without applying, okay, what does it mean to myself? Yes. And I think the point is that we must be very cautious and careful that as Seventh-day Adventist Christians and non-Adventists who are listening to us online, that the life you live is a reflection of the life you will live when Christ comes. Amen. And that's very important. Over to you, Elder John. Amen. Good, good points there. I mean, my, my mind went on Christian in Pilgrim's Progress again. It's a, uh, until he had the understanding that he had to put down his burden, but we still need to carry it across. Anyway, let me not speak. Elder Stanley, good to see you. Um, you have a point for us. Yeah, I think uh, Pastor has been able to cover some of the areas I wanted to touch with, but taking up that cross is quite in-depth. So what I want to add there is, if you want to take up the cross, one of the things we have to consider, it means losing some of your closest friends for Jesus. It means alienating some, some of the family that won't allow you to worship God the way you want. It means sometimes loss of reputation because of what you used to do before. You don't do that anymore because of you have Christ in you because nothing won't come between you and your God. Maybe losing your life. Some people have lost their job because of what they believe. Mm. So, picking up that cross, that cross was heavy on the way to Golgotha. We need to understand that. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you all. Keep your points coming in. Go ahead, Pastor. But um, somebody says here, Geraldine McKnight says, taking up the cross, I feel ultimately starts in our mind. I think Paul says, Paul talks about being crucified with Christ. And Paul also talks about, let this mind be new, which was in Christ Jesus. Now, here's a question that somebody asks, and I think it's important that we answer this question. That's George, George, Georgia Will, Williamson. She says, how can one overcome sin? Because there are some of us who have been in the church for however long, and we're still behaving the same way we're, we're behaving when we came into the church. Is there a reason, Elder Johnny, why, why some of us why many of us, including myself, why do we struggle to overcome some of, the, some of our weaknesses and some of our tendencies? Mm. I think this is a question that we need to ask ourselves. 
I mean, I, I'll chip in if I may. Um, I'm going back to the explanation that Elder David gave and you followed up on. It's, it's recognizing then that, as Paul has said, there's a battle that's going on between carnal man and spiritual man. And if you think that you can fight this battle alone, you're going to lose. And it's recognizing that it's, it's, it's a daily, or if you want to break it down, it's recognizing it's an hourly thing, that you've got to be committed each hour because you know that this struggle is coming along. You know, you, you, you could have a good mind, you could be leaving church and you've been uplifted and then some driver cuts you up and you're ready to, uh, you're ready to say something that you're not supposed to. Again, the, the carnal man is, is ready to jump in. So it's recognizing that this constant battle is there. And unless you are intentional, you're going to lose. And, and uh, you know, it's only by anchoring to Christ as we're, as we're going to touch on. But let's have your comments coming in. Um, see if we can get can some I add answers. something as well? Go ahead, Pete. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, in, in equally to what you're, you're saying, sometimes we think of how we were in our relationship with Christ in the past. As we mentioned earlier in the lesson, the people were grounded in, in Christ and so on. And it's, it's that looking at the past that sometimes makes us fall away because we think we're always in a position where we used to be. But we need to think of our present religious experience because that is what keeps us, keeps us grounded. We can't just harp on about the past. Daily sacrifices, you said. Thank you. Great, great answers. Go ahead, Pastor. If we could get some members who have been in the church for a long time or those who have just come into the church to give us give us an idea i mean not i'm not saying be pompous i'm not saying you know but give give those of us who are struggling an idea as to how how can i overcome or how have they overcome some of the challenges that 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 they're struggling with okay so let's take someone who's going to represent those that have been in church for a long time, those of you who are relatively new, we want to hear from you as well. So, Mum, over to you. Yes. This question, <laughs> I will put it also as self-examination and being honest. Mm. The thing is that, you see, we like to wear a mask. We will not mm. be honest. And this is our problem. We are <laughs> completely covered by sin, inside, outside. We must come to the place to hate sin and love righteousness. And what I find, the more I want God is the more sometimes I will find things coming up to me that I dislike. And it can even be from a good friend. Many times you find these things hit you so hard. And there it is, how God has made us, is to run or defend ourselves. These natures, God put it within us, we born this way. Iniquity, by which we were conceived and we were born in sin, it is always there. It will always fight us. And the more we want Christ, is the more the other one uses someone to come and derail you at the moment when you don't expect. You wouldn't believe, you don't expect it, and it comes. Because you weren't planning anything, you weren't thinking it away from your thought. It comes. You slipped up, you behave how you should not. And if you are not that type of person that like to make person uncomfortable, you feel disgusted with yourself inside, outside. And it bothers you because this is not how you want to be. The other one is not very happy 
when persons decide they want Christ and to choose him as their personal savior, he's not happy about it. He goes after them all the time. As last night while studying, and my son made a, 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 quote, a, a statement. He said, many times, we cannot see the evil that is around us. And then I remembered what Sister White said. If only God could have removed the veil from our eyes, just released it from a little while, for us to see what is happening about us, we will humble ourselves before him and ask him to help. No one should ever come to the place to think they have achieved. So if the evil one will use them to dismantle someone else, and they see that person as being wrong, that person doing the wrong thing. But what has that person done? If I have caused it, what have I done? Am I all right? I didn't do anything. But because the person spoke, the person is the one that has done it all. No. God sees within us and he knows everything. So my story is, this is something we struggle with. We hate it. We must tell God we don't like it. Yeah. We must want God more. Yeah. And every moment, every time, let us submit ourselves to him. And we know our weakness. Let us place that in his hands and ask him to help us. I'll stop there. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. So, Amen. someone who's relatively new in church, we look forward to hearing from you as well. Um, in the meantime, following such stern warnings that God gave through his servant, the Apostle Paul, Paul then goes on to give affirmation and hope to those reading or hearing his words. Um, Elder Peter, Hebrews 6, 9 through to 12, please. Just read and expand on the positives of these words that Paul shares. Yes, um, I liked the New International Version and the way that they put this, but just put a little bit of context. Prior to verse 9, there were some warnings issued. But here we're being told that it's not all doom and gloom. There is some hope. And the New International Version even starts by calling the hearers dear friends. It reads as follows, Hebrews 6, 9 to 12. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case, the things that have to do with salvation. And then the chapter continues with words of encouragement and recognition. It says in verse 10, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. Verse 11, we want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realized. That in itself is a message of hope. He says we don't want you to become lazy and so on, um, but we see in Hebrews several warnings throughout the book of Hebrews, but they are always followed by encouragement. Mm, mm, which is a good way of speaking with people. Um, Elder Claudia, now I'm sure you've had to utilize faith and patience at work and maybe even church too. No names need to be mentioned, please. Um, now, who is mentioned as a good example in verses 13 through to 15 about patience? Um, that's the same chapter, Hebrews 6, please. So again, from uh, uh, New International Version, um, when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no greater, since no, there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so, after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. It's true. Um, as, as Christians, we need to have patience. And I think that people who have patience, they, that is because they have faith. If you don't know that you are going to get on the bus, you won't join the queue. So you, you will put yourself in the queue so you know God will answer. And 
this can be experienced on an everyday basis. On a patient, I'm not probably the best person to talk about patients. I don't, I, I'm fighting for this. <laughs> but I'm struggling and hopefully I'll get there one day. Because looking at Abraham, I really admire him. Although he did try at some point to help God, he did get there in the end and he had the faith that God will, will answer his, uh, will, will keep his promise and he will give him what he promised. Um, and this is just for us to, to, um, to, to learn from. And also there are examples where the other uh, people, they didn't want to, uh, to wait on God. Uh, they wanted, like me, being um, impatient. They wanted to get there faster. Like Jacob, he didn't think that when it comes to the, to the blessing, his father will give him the right blessing. So he tried to help God in that respect. So that didn't end up well. So I, my, my takeaway from this um, uh, verses is that we need to have patience and that is just because we have faith. And if we trust God, he will give us what he is good, best for us in his time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Confession is good for the soul as well, they say. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Pastor, any answers to how can we overcome sin or any other comments at this time? Yeah, before I, I give, uh, there's quite a lot of amens to the point that um, Mother Saul made. As a matter of fact, somebody asked if she would adopt her. <laughs> so I'm sure she can send me an email and I'll pass it on to Mother Saul. She has enough children, I think. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not another children. No, okay, right, not another child. Okay, but here's some points people are saying, um, you know, in terms of overcoming sin. Pray, read the word, worship. Um, somebody says relationship with God, not just religion. Some of us, we are Adventists, mm. but we're not Christians. That's, I think that's what the person is saying, yeah? Um, Paul, it says we must purpose in our heart. Uh, we must be intentional. Um, Rodney says, cry out, O wretched man, woman that I am, who can save me from this flesh? Brother Mumba says we must fully surrender. Clive says learn to really, really love the Lord, which is what um, Mother Saul says. Le love the Lord so much that you hate sin mm -hmm. so badly that every time you do it, you, want to, you just really want to run back to Christ mm -hmm. like Peter did and confess what he did uh, and ask God for forgiveness. Now, here's the question that you've asked. Let me see um, what we have here being said. Um, I want to, David, David says something which is very important. He says, falling away from Christ should not be confused with falling away from, from um, I, I know he put the word unbiblical Christian church doctrine, right? Um, so I have to be very cautious here in, in how I phrase. Well, just basically, some of us we are fall, some of us um, we are falling away because there's a perception that we're not following the teachings or the, the practices of the church, um, but we're still connected to Christ. And 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 you know, let us not be confused or, or conflicted with that with that idea um, that that we can do that. Right. Let me go down to this point. Um, I, I'm sure I see. Um, Alana at the um, at the mic. So can I can you take her Ella John and then I'll come back. Yes, that's fine. Alana, morning. Morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Um, I just want to add to sin and where we stand with it. Um, the phrase "to err" is human. To forgive is divine. This was originally from a poem written in 19, or sorry, 1711 by an English poet called Alexander Pope. Um, in Matthew 22, Jesus speaks of how we sometimes err. And though it was speaking of marriage, he also speaks of forgiveness. If you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will not forgive yours. 
I think when we carry animosity, malice, unforgiveness in our hearts, we are shutting out the Holy Spirit to do his work in us, which is the tools we need to overcome sin. Deep point. Thank you very much, Thank Alana. you. Pastor, did you find your point? Yes, I think I, I have. Um, so, um, the willful commission of a known sin, silence the witness in the voice of the spirit and separates the soul from God, Angela um, Green reference in the unpardonable sin. Um, Caroline says the best form of witnessing to anyone is to manifest Christ in our lives and, and make, the, make, the, make the gospel very practical. I think sometimes as Adventists, we're very good at being theoretical. We do not demonstrate. You know this, the story of the Good Samaritan, right? Mm -hmm. they, were good, they, were good, they, were good, they were good people, but they just didn't, did not apply what Christ expected them to apply. Um, Eve says, hold on to your faith. Make a, make, a, make a conscious decision to commit, to surrender to God. Um, Rodney says we need to teach and preach victory in, in Christ. Sandra says we are, we are sheep and he's our shepherd. We are fully dependent on our shepherd to herd us in the, in the pen and keep us in. So th that idea about being constantly going on and keeping on to Christ. Now here's a question, Elder Johnny, and I'm sure I mean, our viewers and others will answer it. Um, Karen's question, which is, which is it? If the unpardonable sin is unpredictable, how can it be pardoned? Read that one again, please. If the unpardonable sin is unpredictable, how can it be pardoned? If it's unpredictable. Yeah, because there seems to be a, a kind of a... Because, because the idea of, of, of the unpardonable sin is, a, is something that you're doing over Absolutely. and over and over and over again. Absolutely. And every time you're forgiven, you go back and say, I'm sorry, but you go back and do it. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, go back and do it. Go back and do it. Go back and do it. So it's not unpredictable, that's, is it? That's what I'm struggling it's a, with. It's a, it's a habit mm -hmm. that has become ingrained in your DNA. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that's my understanding. Sure. Um, it would be interesting for the person if they maybe... Uh, outline why they think the unpardonable sin is, is unpredictable, but maybe the, 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 the penny is dropped. So just, just keep us posted on that. While you look for that, um, just in continuing to oh, provide right. hope. She, she corrected. Go if ahead. the unpardonable is unpardonable. Ah, okay. If that. the unpardonable is, un, I think it was a typographical error. Okay. If the unpardonable is unpardonable, well, it, it, it gives it away. If it's unpardonable, it's unpardonable. It is unpardonable. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, 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 and let us understand, Christ is not willing that any should perish, mm -hmm. but that all should come to repent. Yeah. So the unpardonableness of the sin is because you don't want it to be pardoned. That's right. That's right. Does that make sense? Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Hopefully that makes sense to the person and the others online as well. So as I was just saying, in continuing to provide hope and assurance, let's just take a look at how chapter 6 of Hebrews concludes. So Elder Claudia, if you could just read for us, please, Hebrews 6, verses 17 through to 20. Uh, yes. Uh, and I will uh, use again the uh, international version. And it says, Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his very purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor of the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of the Melchizedek. That was our memory verse. Thank you very much. So, um, Elder Peter, I don't know how much of a sailor you are at heart, but does the imagery of Jesus as the anchor of your soul, does that work for you? Uh, hopefully, in view of what Pastor has just said, that we could sometimes be theoretical and not practical. I hope that this answer will be practical for people. 
Now, I'm not a sailor, but I've been on various different types of vessels on the sea, and I'm very, very interested in how things work. And I know that an anchor is basically a metal hook which actually embeds itself into the seabed to keep a vessel in place. Because without the anchor, a boat will drift with the wind, it will drift when the waves move as well. So when we imagine a vessel like, like a small boat or even a medium-sized fishing boat, dropping an anchor to embed itself into the seabed is easy. Uh, you drop the anchor and the boat stays in place. Now, I've had the privilege of going on some cruises in the past. Now, when we think of the ship, it's not just a boat, it's a huge vessel. It's like a floating hotel. Mm. There are actually 19 floors or 19 stories in one of the ships that I went on. It weighed over 112,000 tons. Over 3,000 passengers were on that, on that ship and 1,200 crew. And when we arrived at a port, I looked over and I was shocked. Do you know what I saw? To, to keep the ship in place, they dropped an anchor to keep this massive vessel in place. One anchor they, they dropped to keep it in place. Now, if Jesus is the anchor of our soul, imagine how spiritual, spiritually secure we will be. If our soul is secured in Jesus, we will avoid being tossed about by the winds and the waves of the different doctrines that people are throwing at us, as, as Ephesians 4 verse 14 highlights. Now, the key element of the text that Elder Claudia just read in Hebrews 6 verses 17 to 20 are that God made an oath to make us heirs of what was promised and gave us Jesus as our high priest. Now, because it's impossible for God to lie, we can therefore conclude that the anchor to our soul is that oath that Jesus made with us. Furthermore, that anchor is within the veil, which is where Jesus plays out the high priest role. And that veil, um, the high priest role in that veil is also where the Father is, the government of the universe. So if we've got our anchor secured, in the one who governs the universe, come on, where, where can we drift to? Mm -hmm. We're secure. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 That's powerful. Um, Elder Claudia, I don't know, have you got anything to add to that? You, you can't add much to, to all this, you know. It's just that it's such a, a powerful um, uh, illustration. So, yeah, I totally agree. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Pastor, let me, as our panelists prepare their takeaway comments, let me take your uh, final comments, please. I'll quickly just jump in with some pointers here. We, we cannot be renewed, as Sister Maria Kute says, uh, we cannot be renewed to repent if we don't agree that he must increase, mm. but I must decrease. Um, Brother Muambe says, it is scary to know that we can reach to a point of no return. Mm. And that is very scary. Artful Dodger, welcome. We need to be careful as to what he said. Uh, well, well, okay, right, talking about people misquoting the spirit of prophecy there. Um, Sandra says, it is only 6, 6 a.m. where I live, uh, but, I woke, but when I woke up early to come online to ask for prayer on behalf of my niece, Karina, she's urgently in need of divine intervention. Please pray for her. Can we just pause a second, Elder Johnny, quickly and just pray for this Go ahead. person here? Um, Father God, we, we put... Um, Sandra's niece, um, Karina, before you. She needs divine intervention. Mm -hmm. And Lord, we pray right now that your Holy Spirit will reach out. You are still the balm in Gilead. Yes, you have the power to heal not just our sins, but our physical infirmities. Mm -hmm. So right now, Father God, reach out to Karina. And Lord, may your will be done in her life. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Um, so, 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 so here's a here's a point, Elder Johnny, that I want to make. The Christian life is. Erlene says, Erlina says, the Christian life is a struggle. None of us, none of us are perfect, but but as a child who is now learning to walk, when we fall down, no matter how hard we fall, we can get get up, because God is with us. And my my thought about this is, read the text. Notice where the anchor is fastened. It is not on the seabed. Mm. The text, and it blew me away when I read it. The, the, it, says, it says the anchor is fastened, wait for this, 
to the throne of God. That's right. Now, read it again. You get it. You probably won't get it now, but tonight you're like, you, you're like, wow, not only is Jesus pleading on my behalf, but God has fastened the anchor that Jesus has to his throne. Wow. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we're running right out of time. Elder Claudia, what do you want to lead us, leave us with? I, um, I will quote a, a, a paragraph from um, Ellen White from Steps to Christ. And he says, our growth in grace, our joy, our usefulness, all depend upon our union with Christ. It is by communion with him daily, hourly, by abiding in him that we are to grow in grace. He is not only the author, but the finisher of our faith. It is Christ first and last and always. He is to be with us not only at the beginning and at the end of our course, but at every step of the way. Like someone who, uh, I want to add this, that someone mentioned these um, principles and I was really impressed. Uh, and he says that there are three legs of to, to be... Um, land up in, in a Christian journey, and that is reading the word, which you have to do every day, uh, our food, uh, prayer, again, continuous prayer, and the third one would be serving to others. By serving others, uh, we will be able to practice what we read in the morning and what we pray during the day. Amen. Thank you very much. And Elder Peter. Sure. Now, Hebrews 6, what we studied this week, reminds us that our focus can sometimes become diverted away from God when we give more importance to our problems, our challenges, or even our successes. And Jesus, however, wants to encourage us to refocus our attention on him, to anchor our hope in him, and to show our dependence on him because our salvation is reliant on it. Amen. Thank you. And Pastor? I'm going to read my good friend David's comment, because I love it. It says, our soul is real and must be continuously within the veil. That is to say, we must be continually in the presence of God, a privilege secured by Christ. We then have all power to overcome sin. And he put the word all in bold. And finally, Brother Mombi says, the cares and hustles of life makes many to drift away like ship without an anchor. But everyone who takes shelter in Jesus will never, will never, never be disturbed by life storms. Amen. And in the same vein, before I hand over to Sister Diane, in this fast-paced life that we live in, sometimes we need to stand still in order to see the salvation of the Lord. But a storm is coming that is threatening to push you where you don't want to go. Keep anchored in Jesus. He is guaranteed to see you through. Thank you for your comments and for your time next week. Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Sister Diane, over to you. Thank you, Elder Johnny, and thank you, Pastor, and thank you to all the participants. What a great study that we've had. Um, so in closing, um, let us truly humble ourselves before God. Let us truly acknowledge him and desire a life that is pleasing to him. We are challenged daily, but let us fix it, fixate ourselves on our anchor that is Christ. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for being our anchor, for grounding us, for holding us down. In this life we live, in the distractions and the goings on and the busyness, we are thankful that we have you to keep us still, um, to guide us, to protect us and to lead us, Lord. We are so thankful, Lord. Help us to truly take hold of your word and keep it in our hearts, Lord. Help us to be truly guided and led by it and 
Help us to really put it into practice in our day-to-day -day lives. Let us not just hear your word um, and not act on it, but let us be doers, as it says in your word. Help us to, to live a life that just reflects you, Lord. Um, as you lived on earth, let us to live in the lives that we have. Lord, I pray that you're with us in the proceedings um, of church and, and that your spirit pours out onto us, Lord, um, and that everything goes according to your will. In your precious and holy name we do pray. Amen.